What's going on all y'all Zook Junkies? In today's video, we are going to be tackling, reassembling the bottom end of the 1.3 liter for the Suzuki Samurai. I just want to give y'all an update as far as timelines for videos. I know I've had a couple of y'all ask me about when I'm planning on doing an installation video for the Toyota 3K carb. I really want to dyno that motor in the budget build in stock form to get a baseline and that way you guys kind of can have an idea of what your, you know, bone stock 30 year old Suzuki Samurai is going to be outputting. I got with the local dyno place and they're not going to have an opening until the second week after spring break. So I need to have it dynoed first, which I'll do a video there filming it, dynoing it, seeing what it does, how it responds. And then after that, immediately after that I should say, I will be able to install the Toyota 3K car with Gary's kit. In preparation for that dyno day, there are some things that I do need to do to that budget build. I plan on reassembling the bottom end, reassembling the head, installing the head. I actually just ordered an ARP stud kit for that engine. I wasn't going to do that, but I know just one of the problematic things about the Suzuki Samurai is blowing head gaskets. It's just something that this motor in particular likes to do. I just want to go ahead and take the extra step since the motor's apart. I'm just, I just feel like I might as well just go ahead and do it. But I'm pretty sure y'all have been waiting long enough for me to start reassembling this bottom end, so let's go ahead and get into it. All right, y'all. So one of the very first things that I need to do before we can put the pistons in, well, two things I actually need to do first. The pistons on the 1.3 liter are press fit, so we'll need to disassemble those pistons and install the new pistons. But before I do that, I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna hone these cylinder bores. This motor doesn't have a lot of miles on it. There is still some visible cross hatching in there, but I'm using new piston rings and I want them to seat properly. So I'm gonna go ahead and err on the side of caution and I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna hone the cylinder. There are several different styles of hones that you can use. You can use a three-legged hone like this. this is a very traditional type of cylinder hone. The nice thing about this style of hone is that, as you can see, it spreads open and closed. It accommodates multiple different sizes of cylinder bores. I've been told or I've heard that this style of hone can has a capability of kind of oblonging the cylinder bore. I haven't had an issue with that with this. I guess it depends on how much wear is in the cylinder. I mean, if you're going to just hone it and not machine it or what have you. The other type is a flex hone or a ball hone, these are sized. You can't really use one of these for multiple different size cylinder bores. You have to get the correct size for your application. And they come in multitude of different grits. It's not just like one tool that can do everything. You have to buy the specific one for your application and the coarseness versus kind of a universal one. So we're just gonna use this. Let's go ahead and get to honing. Alright y'all, so now that we have the cylinders honed, we can work on these pistons. You have essentially two different styles of pistons. You have free-floating pistons and then you have press-fit pistons. 
Free floating pistons, generally what happens is you can put the wrist pin into the connecting rod, it'll all fit, and then you put clips on the end. And the connecting rod will free float on the pin. Press fit is this style where the wrist pin is pressed into the connecting rod. And if you look in there, as I move the connecting rod back and forth, you can see the pin is moving with it. See, look at moving in the sides. The best way to get these off is a combination of heat and pressure. So the nice thing about having a shot press is I can set this up and I can put a socket and I can put pressure on it with the shot press and then I can heat up this small bore of the connecting rod, make the hole expand and then I can drive it through. You can just press them out, but you have the possibility of destroying this piston like it matters we're replacing them and it's really kind of sketchy like it's it can be scary so using pressure and heat is a lot safer you know you put a little bit of pressure on it and you start to heat it up and then you start giving it a little bit more pressure and then it just <whistles> slides out and to put the new pistons on the best way i've actually seen people do it is with just heat alone which i will show you all after we get all these pistons off of the connecting rods Something I want to make mention is the direction of these connecting rods. Because I'm reusing bearings, I don't want to flip them around. I want to keep them in their orientation on the crankshaft. I don't want to disturb that at all. I want to put it back in the way it came out because there was no oil starvation. There were no damaged bearings. This motor only has like 4,000 miles on it, 3,500 miles. So there's nothing wrong with reusing these bearings in my case. I have gone ahead and I've marked the connecting rod with an F in reference to the arrow on the piston. I also need to mark them for what cylinder they go in because it's gonna matter on the connecting rod. I have them marked front, so I'll just put a one, a two, a three, and a four. So now they're they're marked. I know which end is going to face forward in the motor. I know which bore they go in. The new pistons are not gonna matter what bore they go into. Only thing I'm gonna to have to do is adjust ring gap, which I'll show you how to do that after we do this as well. So I'm gonna go ahead and get these off. A little warm. Less than a minute. All right, y'all, so that was extremely painless. Uh, before I did all this, I did my own research. I watched YouTube, of course. So I had seen people, you know, pressing it out without heat, and then, you know, the whole heat thing makes sense. Uh, the heat works a lot better than that, in my opinion. But y'all might have noticed that I showed y'all what type 
of fuel I'm using, I'm using map gas. I do have a propane torch, which is the blue bottle, and everything that I've seen online is that the propane doesn't get hot enough to do the job, but this map gas, it worked really well for getting these wrist pins out of these connecting rods. So now the next part we need to do is get the new piston and wrist pin on the old connecting rod. Now I don't know if y'all noticed with the press, the way it was on those blocks, they actually have a device or a tool for doing it in a press. It actually, it's got like a half moon that cradles the piston. So whenever you press in it, it won't distort or fudge up the piston itself. If y'all noticed whenever I was pressing on it, the cast plates that come with the press pressed into this and pretty much made the pistons useless. So pressing these in isn't going to work. Not without that specialty tool. That's probably a couple of hundred dollars or you know, I could probably like take a piece of pipe, cut it in half, uh, drill a hole and you know, maybe get like some C channel and weld it to it. So you know, there is the possibility of making my own tool, but from what I've seen people do as far as this, this is so much easier. What we're going to do is we're gonna take this connecting rod and we're gonna heat it up with the map gas until it starts to blue. The moment it blues, you can put it inside there and then you can just slide the, the wrist pin in. It literally just slides in. You have a couple of seconds to work with it so you can slide it in, grab the wrist pin with both fingers to kind of center it and then you can move your connecting rod to roughly the center point of the pin. There's plenty of time. We're gonna get the orientation of our connecting rod. I have an F for front, this is one. You have the mark on top of your piston. So I need to align that, that arrow and the F. So I need to make sure that I'm putting it in the correct way. So I'm pretty much going to line all of the pistons up with the arrow facing that way on the workbench and I will just pull the pin out and just have it sitting right there. So all I have to do is push it in. Well, I would say that that was a huge success. That was so fast and painless and wasn't scary whatsoever like with a press. 
now I'm just going to take the marks from the side of my connecting rod and I'm marking the tops of my pistons with what they are or what bore they go in I should say and now I'm ready to install the crankshaft. So one of the most important things about doing anything when it comes to assembling an engine, whether it be the cylinder head or the block or anything like that, is to make sure that you have a clean block or cylinder head. You, I've already gone through and I've already cleared out all of these oil passages, just double checked everything to make sure it's free from any sludge or anything like that. This motor, because it had such low mileage, it didn't really have a lot of sludge, but it's always good just to double check. The last thing you wanna do is spend all this money and time and put a motor together and then you just grenade it. I'm going to be using some of this Lucas assembly lube for all of my bearings and tight tolerance things. It is definitely a must to use assembly lube. It's kind of like motor oil, but it has um, a high, it has other things added to it like zinc and molly, stuff like that. It's just really good for seating and sticking and staying on those surfaces for that initial break-in before the motors got oil pressure and stuff like that. Let's go ahead and get to it. So I've got some technical information to pass on to you guys. The main caps, these are easy to put in. I left the bearings in there, just there was no reason to take them out. Whenever you go to put these on, not only will you put assembly lube on the actual bearing surface, you wanna put some on the threads and you wanna make sure that you have some oil on the head of the bolt, not directly on top of the head of the bolt, but in between like the washer and the cap in the washer in the bolt. The reason why you want to do that is there's something called stiction. Now, what that means is that metal on metal has a coefficient of friction. It's just a number that gives value to how much it'll stick to each other. By putting lubricant, you dramatically lower the, co the coefficient of friction and it gives you a more accurate torque number. Some of these bolts, particularly head bolts, they come with a coating, like a really sticky coating on them. If you don't clean that off and use lubricant whenever you go to put your cylinder head on, you will get a false torque reading. And what that'll do is it will actually be, the clamping force will not be as much as it needs to be and you can you know, blow a head gasket. Worst case scenario, warp a cylinder head. So you wanna make sure that you use lubrication on the threads and on the heads of these bolts. And as far as the amount of lubricant, you don't have to worry about overdoing it. Yes, you could go to the extent to where you're being wasteful, but the more lubricant you use, it's not gonna hurt anything. I, I would err on the side of caution rather than trying to preserve your lubricant.
So I wanna show y'all something before I put the oil pump on. I'm gonna slightly modify this new ASIN oil pump. This style of oil pump is not just indigenous to this 1.3 liter. It, goes, it comes on a lot of Japanese engines. And one of the things that they do whenever they uh, make the ports for the oil that come from the oil pickup into the pump and then out to the motor, which are these two holes right here, they have block off ports that they, you know, they drill into the housing and then they drill cross into it. Right inside there, there's the edge of those, where those two holes intersect. Well, there's generally a sharp edge, like a really sharp edge where that oil has to try to make it past. That makes it really hard on this oil pump to pull oil by that. And what it does is it actually causes the pump to cavitate. One of the things that you can do to help your pump with a Dremel, just kind of shave that edge, just round that edge. So that way the oil can flow by a nice smooth edge instead of kind of abruptly trying to make a 90 degree turn because fluid doesn't move that way. It likes to sweep and flow. That sharp edge causes cavitation is which causes this style of pump to fail. That's what I want to do right now. I want to go ahead and address that issue right now just because we're going to be running a turbo. We're going to be pushing this motor a little bit harder than it normally would and I kind of want to give it the best chance it has. So that's something I want to do right now. y'all I've got the crank in and torqued down I've got the oil pump modified primed torqued down and I have the rear main seal torqued down so now we can move on to actually gapping the rings for the pistons inside the service manual it says some 
It has a strange way of actually like measuring your end gap. It wants to put the piston ring at the bottom of the bore to actually check. Now, traditionally, whenever I've rebuilt motors, you usually just go down an inch from the deck of the bore. Uh, one of the reasons why is it's very difficult to get a piston ring out whenever it's all the way down into the cylinder bore. I can't even fit one hand down that cylinder bore, let alone like try to get in there with both hands to try to get the ring out. Uh, maybe that's because I've done like V8 rebuilds and with a V style motor, whenever the piston is at top dead center, the connecting rod is fully extended out and you have the most play. So that's usually where the cylinder bore itself is largest in diameter. Uh, kind of doesn't matter after you have it machined and you know it's the same diameter through the entire bore. Maybe inline motors don't have any play issues, but I can tell you when that piston is all the way down at bottom, the bottom of the cylinder wall, there's a part of the cylinder wall that, that piston's not even at, let alone the compression ring which is all the way at the top to ring landings is going to be at. So I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna do it my way. I'm gonna do an inch from the top. And we have some specifications here. We have the standard and max limit for the top in the second ring. The top ring standard limit, or standard range I should say, is seven thousandths of an inch, well seven nine, so we could just say eight thousandths of an inch to twelve thousandths of an inch, with a max limit of twenty-seven thousandths of an inch. And the second rings limit uh, standard range is eight thousandths of an inch to thirteen thousandths of an inch with a max limit of twenty seven thousandths of an inch so just in general like if you want to do force induction if you want to do nitrous things of that nature you always do a larger ring gap because whenever you do any sort of force induction or nitrous you're increasing pressure inside the cylinder. When you increase pressure, you increase temperature. And what happens is, this piston is made out of cast aluminum. The rings are usually made out of some sort of steel, whether it's moly or something of that derivative. So aluminum expands at double the rate of steel. So what ends up happening is, that ring that's in this ring landing won't grow It'll stay, not only that, it has the force of the cylinder wall, but this piston will grow. And that, that ring will end up choking the piston, and what I believe happened in cylinder number two on the motor before the old pistons, was it constricted so much that it actually snapped the ring landing off. So that's something that we have to do to compensate. And Myron says to actually add a thousandth of an inch. If you notice the range, and then you have the limit, the limit is far outside of the range because the outside of the ring is scraping on the cylinder wall and it's getting deterior it's it's getting worn away so less outside material allows that ring to grow i think i'm going to add a thousandth of an inch to the max end of the standard range so let me go ahead and show you guys the process for actually checking and adjusting the ring end gap just want to make mention, if you see any riding on these rings, the riding goes to the top of the piston. So we're going to start with cylinder number one, first compression ring. So I'll go ahead and show you all. I got my markings towards the top. And to put this ring in, the easiest way to do it is there's the gap. Squeeze the gap together, drop the piston down in the bore, and then flip it around. Now take your piston and connecting rod to square up the ring and on this stock piston about halfway in the pin is an inch depth. So we'll take it and we'll push the ring down to about halfway. So our ring gap is on this side. We'll take our .014. It does fit. So we don't even need to file this ring. All right, y'all, I've made an executive decision. I'm going to change my range just because it doesn't do any good to not show you how to actually properly adjust your ringing gap. I'm going to, I'm not gonna go all the way to the limit. The limit is 
0 0.0275, I'm going to go to 0 0.02. That's what I'm gonna file the rings to. Even Myron stated that whenever he does these turbo kits, it's actually a little bit better that it's on a worn motor. And I'm assuming it's because the piston rings have actually worn away and the gap has increased on their own. You know, you throw this turbo kit on a motor that has some rings that are worn a little bit and then you increase those cylinder temperatures, the piston swells up and it compensates for that. So to show you guys how to do this, take a file, we put it in a vise and we are going to file away a little bit at a time. Now, there is an actual process for doing this. The way we're gonna do it is we are going to actually file towards the inside of the ring. And then you'll relieve pressure, come up, start again, then file to the inside of the ring. And the reason for that is there are specific types of rings, like Molly rings and stuff that have a coating. As a matter of fact, if you look at this ring, the outside of the ring is kind of like machined, it's silver, then the top of the ring is dark and the inside of the ring is dark. You don't really want to chip the outside of the ring. You know, you could we could file it and there could be like a little breakage or something like that. We don't want to really disturb the outside finish. So that's the reason why we're gonna file into the ring. Also want to make mention to you guys that you don't have to work like one side than the other. You can just work one entire side of the ring. It's completely fine. But after you get done filing this ring, it's a good idea to take like a little triangular file and deburr the top and the bottom and even the back where you filed into. And the reason you want to do that is because when this ring is inside the groove of the piston, it will actually spin around inside the piston. You don't want to have any gnarled edges that could get caught in the groove and cause this ring to quit spinning. So you want to make sure that you deburr the edges. You don't have to do it after every single time, but you need to do it before you install the ring into the piston. So we're going to take our filed ring, we're going to squeeze the gap, Drop it in, flip it around, get our inch depth. And then we will recheck. So two hundredths of an inch doesn't fit, but it was kind of close. So let's try, let's try 18. 18 is a little tight and 17 fits so we need to file it a little bit more So now I've got the second compression ring and the process is literally the same. I'm gonna take it, gonna drop it in the bore, get my feeler gauge, see where I'm at, to where I wanna go, and then go file it, and just keep on rechecking and filing and rechecking as I need. This might seem like a very tedious and time consuming process, and that's because it is. It's the reason why engine builders get paid so much money to build you a motor, because it's very labor intensive. All right, I've got my top and second compression ring gapped. Now we can move on to installing the oil control ring. So the oil control ring, or rings I should say, is made up of three rings. You actually have like your actual oil control ring, and then you have 
like your two wipers, essentially. They're not as thick as the compression rings, so they don't have the same uh, tension on the cylinder bore. And so this ring kind of holds oil in it and these kind of wipe it up and down the cylinder. I want to show y'all. If you look at them, you can see like the high and low rib. Well, if you look above the high rib towards the back, there's actually like more of the ring sticking up and on the bottom low rib, there's more of the ring protruding down. The way you put these, you install these is you install this one first because this ring will actually sit with that extra little piece of the high rib protruding up behind it. So you can't install these or one of these in first and try to get this in. It won't work. This kind of takes up the entire space of the third larger ring landing. Take it, you insert it in, just like that. There's the ends, no overlap, they just butt up against each other. And then you take this next ring, and you kind of work it down a little bit at a time. And I tried to avoid getting it in, into an actual like ring groove, because it's really kind of hard to get it out. So you want to work it around a little bit at a time. See, like it just fell in to the top groove, but you want to take it from that groove, you want to like go all the way down to the very bottom first because it's going to be really hard to get that other uh, sweeper ring to get past this one. And also don't go all ham on it either because you can distort the ring because these rings um, don't have a lot of tensile strength. They're, they can't take as much bending and moving as the top two rings can. Okay, there we go. There we go. Got it in. So now we'll take the next piston or the next uh, oil control ring, kind of sweeper seal. It's probably got a more technical name than that, but that's what I'm calling it. See, you can kind of just work it around and there you go. Now, the ring end gaps have a particular order, but we're not too concerned with that at this point. We're just focusing on getting the rings on the piston. So, the same way with the other ones, you kind of get one edge, start it, and then you open the ring and kind of work its way down. Also, this ring's got a different profile. See, it will not fit into the top ring landing because it is too thick. To actually fit in there. So now go on to the second one. It might seem like it's really awfully big, but it's fine. It'll compress. Also remember you need to deburr it before you install these. You know, just kind of make sure they kind of spin around freely. You can take this one, the top one, you can kind of drop that one side in the groove, then come around and then whoop, there it is. It's in there. So piston number one, ring end gaps have been filed down. All the rings are installed on the piston. So now I get to do all of that to the rest of the cylinders. Well, I've got all of the piston rings gapped and installed on all the pistons. So now we get to stab those pistons into the cylinder bore and connect them to the crankshaft. So before we put these pistons in the cylinder bore, we have to orientate the rings properly on the piston. So in the service manual, it gives an actual diagram of where they're gonna go on the piston. So you have the arrow that's on top of the piston that orients this side of the piston facing towards the front of the engine and then Right over here, number two, that is the gap for the first compression ring. Then three, 180 degrees around, is the gap for the second compression ring. And then this one that's labeled four and four, that is actually the <clears throat> oil ring rail gaps. Those are those little two that act as uh, like wipers to wipe the oil up and down the cylinder wall. 
it doesn't matter if the top is over here or the bottom's over there or vice versa. They just need to be 180 degrees out and then position not in line with the first and second compression ring. So it's kind of like pie cuts, you know, it's broken up into four, what, four quadrants. So that is how we're going to set up our rings. Let us take piston number uno. And we have the arrow facing to the left. And we're going to position the first compression rings opening up to the upper, upper right. And then we'll take the second one and we'll put its ring gap 180 degrees out. So there's the first ring gap followed by the second ring gap. And then we need to take the oil rings or the oil rail gaps as they're called. This is actually, <laughs> it's a little bit hard. Like moving all these rings around, they're, you're gonna end up moving some of them around, but the you just gotta get them, you know, you just get them close to where they need to be. And then you kind of just like fine tune your gap. And they don't need to be like precisely on point, you know, as long as they're more or less close. So first one, second one, and then oil rail gap, oil rail gap. So now this piston is ready to go into the bore. Now, when it comes to actually putting the piston in the bore of the cylinder, you're going to have to use a specialty tool. And that is a piston ring compressor tool, or they have a uh, piston ring compressor pliers, a regular piston ring compressing tool will look something like this. It's kind of like a band and it has a lever. Sometimes they can take like an Allen key or in this case it take, it's, a, it's a quarter inch square drive. Tighten it and it makes it smaller. And then you pull this lever and then you loosen it and it opens the band. So like this tool will accommodate many different types of pistons, or many different size pistons. And then you have like a piston ring compressor plier set and it has some pliers. And then it has multiple different bands for multiple different diameter size pistons. It's kind of like the same idea. You would just size your band like this one is two and seven eighths to three and an eighth. That's the diameter of piston that it can accommodate. And then you would hook your pliers into the little nipples and then whenever you compress the pliers it'll close the banding and it has a lock to actually lock the pliers in place put a little assembly lube on the actual bearing mating surface All right, so now for installing this piston and connecting rod into the bore. Make sure that you keep your rubber hose on the stud so that way you don't mar the cylinder wall or mar the bearing surface on the crank for the connecting rod. 
You're also going to want to put some assembly lube on the actual bearing surface like we did on the crank and also lubricate the piston as well as the inside of the piston ring compressor tool because we're going to have to tighten this down a decent amount and if you don't lubricate any of this stuff you're going to have a really hard time trying to get that piston into the cylinder bore. We have our arrow marking forward. This is the front of the engine. This is the rear of the engine. I have it marked number one because I'm retaining my bearings. So they actually need to be like where they came from. And so this tool, it has a little bit of a different surface on each side. So if you notice, this side is smooth and this side has like dimpled out parts of the band. The reason for the dimpled out part of the bands is so that way, whenever you constrict this down, it's going to compress those rings. It won't fall down into the cylinder. So those little push outs help keep this piston ring compressing tool on top of the actual block. Not only that, your square drive to tighten the band, well, it's only on one side. So if you put it in wrong, you won't even be able to tighten this. Get it in there. Be careful that you don't actually pop a ring out of its groove. We'll pull this little lever to start tightening it. Kind of help hold it in place. Tighten that down. Kind of need to come underneath and make sure that your rubber bits are actually like around the mating surface of the crankshaft, otherwise you'll be like trying to hit it down there and it won't want to go. Now you need to keep pressure down on this tool. If you don't keep pressure down on this tool and you're hitting this through here, the ring can actually expand in between this tool and the block and then it won't go anymore. So you kind of have to keep force down on this, this ring tool and then hit the top of the piston with the wooden handle part of a hammer. So now we will flip the motor over and we'll push up on the piston and rotate the crank to get it up here. Pull off our rubber hoses. to expose our studs. Then we take our connecting rod cap, put some assembly lubricant on it. And we'll put some oil on the threads of our connecting rod. So you have these arrows on the main caps facing towards the front of the engine. There's an arrow on the connecting rod that faces the front of the engine. The bearing cap is a 12 millimeter and the torque value is 24 foot pounds to 26 foot pounds of torque. I'm kind of just getting them down there evenly to snug down the cap. Set these to 26 foot pounds. Going to kind of work it back and forth. Double check them. Now it's time to put the rest of the pistons in.
Well, y'all, that is how you rebuild the bottom end of the 1.3 liter for the Suzuki Samurai. I want to invite y'all to check out my Patreon page, link in the description. If this was content that you enjoyed watching, be sure to smash like, and if you haven't already, be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications so that way you can keep up to date on what I've got going on in one of two shops. And I'll catch y'all in the next one. Peace! God damn it, Tom.